निबाशा घुगुती रूंजो हे निबाशा घुगुती रूंजो मेरी एजु सुड़ारी Next, we have author Jan Ki Lennon, who will be sharing from her latest book, Every Creature Has a Story. Hello, I'm Jan Ki Lennon, here to introduce you to my new book, Every Creature Has a Story. It's a collection of 50 essays about amazing animal behaviors. Since this is the Mussoorie Mountain Festival, I picked a high elevation story for you. Every autumn, bar-headed geese set off from Central Asia, crest the Himalaya, and fly into the Indian subcontinent. When you see these birds, the words that come to mind are plump, heavy, maybe beautiful, but not athletic, marathon flyers or world record holders. Typically, the birds take off at dawn, fly all day, and land on the banks of a river or pond where they graze and rest through the evening. And they repeat this routine the next day. But when they reach the great mountains, they fly nonstop for almost 17 hours to cover about 1,500 kilometers. Remember that oxygen is very low at these elevations. To reach such heights, we humans rest for a few days at lower elevations to get our bodies used to the stress of it. If we rush through, we suffer from altitude sickness, such as dizziness, vomiting, and headaches. If we ignore these symptoms, fluid fills our lungs and brains, a condition that can lead to death. The geese, however, don't rest in the mountains. Instead, they energetically flap their wings to maintain their course. This aerobic exercise needs 10 to 20 times more oxygen than grazing on the ground. How do they survive this marathon bout of flying? For one thing, they breathe deeply to drive more air into their enormous lungs, and they pant since the air is so thin. Their hemoglobin, the protein in red blood cells that binds oxygen, is more efficient at sticking to oxygen molecules. Their large hearts pump twice the volume of hemoglobin-rich blood to the rest of the body. Many more capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the body, feed their muscles, delivering oxygen to them. These special features enable the birds to push themselves to the limit without putting their lives on the line. But they aren't the only ones with such high functioning bodies at high altitudes. The people living in the mountains have similar adaptations. They have normal hemoglobin like the rest of us, but they pant much more than plains people. They also have larger lungs just as the birds do. If the journey to India in the autumn is challenging for bar-headed geese, Consider their return voyage in spring. They go from sea level to 7,000 meters in one swoop, the steepest climb in any bird migratory path. Next time you see these plump birds waddling along, remember you're looking at one of the finest athletes in the bird world. Every Creature Has a Story has many more tales like this about a whole range of creatures from plants and insects to elephants and whales. Thank you for reading and watching and coming to this festival. Next, we have Rohit Chakravarti, who will speak on his research on bats in the Himalayan region of Uttarakhand. Hello, I'm Rohit Chakravarti. I'm a researcher studying bats in the Himalayas of Uttarakhand. I'd like to begin by thanking the Masuri Mountain Festival. Uh, I cherish every connection to the, the Himalayas and to Masuri, and it's a privilege for me to be able to share stories about Himalayan bats with all of you. Now, Uttarakhand, as many of you might know, is blessed with remarkable biodiversity. There are tigers, leopards, elephants, and of course the state animal, the musk deer, that are found here. And uh, with such uh, large charismatic animals, the smaller, less charismatic animals often take a backseat in our priorities. But not surprisingly, Uttarakhand also has a remarkable bat diversity. The first and the only surveys here were conducted in the 1870s by the British and they found a rare and enigmatic bat called the Peter's tube nose bat uh, which was found in Jharipani in Masuri and since then that bat has not been seen again in Uttarakhand. 
And if you look at the location of Uttarakhand on the world map, it sits at a crucial juncture where animals from Europe, from the Far East and from Peninsular India merge together. So all of these were reasons that brought me, a person from the plains from dry and hot Nagpur, to start my connection with the mountains. I started my survey of bats in 2016 and 17 in Uttarakhand. My companions throughout the survey were young local boys like Jerry, Bashir, Prabhat and Shamshad who had their own peculiarities and characteristics but the zeal to work was common among them all and all these stories that I'm telling you are made possible by their hard work. We started our work in Dehradun where after a few nights of not catching many bats we got lucky in Forest Research Institute where we met Dr. Arun Pradap Singh who showed us some bats hiding behind a pipe and guess what, they were European free-tailed bats that were not known to occur in the western Himalayan region at that time. After a few such nights uh, of uh, sampling in the foothills, we were ready to move to the hills uh, where Devalsari uh, turned out to be my most favourite uh, place. It's truly a hidden gem in the Aglar Valley uh, beyond Masuri. Um, it's a place that is vastly popular with people who watch butterflies and moths, but the bat potential of that place was not known. It has beautiful Deoda forest surrounded by dry hills, and as a result, there were certain species of bats like the round-eared tube-nosed bat, uh, which uh, is hairy and looks more like a hedgehog than a bat, and the hairy-faced bat, which is found in dry areas in Southeast Asia and Eastern India. We found it for the first time in, uh, in the Western Himalayan region. But since 2017, most of my work has been based in Kedarnath Wildlife Sanctuary. Kedarnath presents certain advantages over other sites. For one, the forest is more intact. Uh, and most importantly, you can cover a gradient of elevations from 1500 to 4000 meters and see how drastically the path diversity changes in a mountain range. It is also home to uh, some very fascinating bats, uh, for example, the somber bat, which uh, was until now known from only Darjeeling, where it was caught in the 1970s, and now 40 years later, we've caught that bat again across the Himalayas in the best. The long-tailed whiskered bat, which is another interesting species, was caught for the first time in India in Kedarnath Wildlife Sanctuary by my team. And then there are species of conservation importance like the Kashmir cave bat. It's, an, it's, a, it's a bat that is endemic to Western Himalayas, depends very heavily on streams and rivers because it feeds on aquatic insects. So that can really be a flagship species for the conservation of stream, streams in Western Himalayas. So after all this stomping around catching bats uh, in Uttarakhand, we found nine species that were found for the first time in the Western Himalayan region. And even more interesting was to record their ultrasonic uh, calls, which uh, can help you tell different species apart. And we created a library, a reference library of echolocation calls of bats. So for the last two years in Kedarnath, we've been putting out automated recorders that can record bat activity night after night during summers and with this we are gathering data like never before on bats in the Himalayas and in, uh, and, at, and in India at large to understand their natural history, their behavior and most importantly how would these species get affected by human disturbance and by climate change. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Dr. Rodney Jackson, Executive Director at the Snow Leopard Conservancy. Hello, my name's Rodney Jackson, and I'll be talking about the endangered snow leopard, a species that I have devoted 40 years to studying and conserving across the Himalaya and Central Asia. Born in South Africa, I grew up in Zimbabwe. And while studying at the University of California, Berkeley, I came across this image in the National Geographic magazine, the first 
photo of a wild snow leopard taken by naturalist George Charlotte. The year was 1972, I was 28 years old, and seeing that cat changed my life. To cut a long story short, I had the privilege of leading the first successful study of this elusive feline, about which so little was known then. It took two weeks to trek into my study area in western Nepal. My Nepalese associates and I collared five cats and tracked them for several years, learning about their movements and natural history. We observed snow leopards to be intensively scent marked their home range, far more than any other cat. Local people could not get over our antics, smelling pungent rock sprays under these overhanging boulders. The study led to the June 1986 cover story in National Geographic. My wife, Darla Hillard, chronicled our four years of adventure in the book Vanishing Tracks, which is available as an e-book now from our website. The snow leopard's range is enormous, from the Himalaya in the south to the southern Siberian mountains of Russia in the north. Scientists think there are somewhere between 4,000 and 7,500 snow leopards left, clearly a species under threat of extinction. The threats include poaching for its bones and beautiful fur, the depletion of the natural prey base, and of course climate change. Snow leopards live high up in mountains, above 3,000 meters up to 6,000 meters, and are found even in Mongolia's desolate Gobi Desert, here in the lower right. They revel in the steepest, rockiest places, and nearly always see people first, even young cubs like these two photographed in Mongolia. Their camouflage is superb. This mother and her two cubs were photographed by citizen scientist Tashigali in Annapurna's conservation range. Getting into the cat's range is challenging. There are very few roads, so one must walk for days to reach that habitat. Here, for example, along the edge of a frozen river in winter, or by crossing traditional plant fiber bridges, as shown here in Ladakh, Zanskar. Livestock are the local people's primary means of livelihood, an important source of their income. Herders keep their sheep and goats in low-walled corrals like this one at night. But if a snow leopard comes by and jumps in, it can wipe out many of the family's livestock in a single night. And so no wonder herders view snow leopards as pests to be eliminated. Preventing such depredation loss is very simple, however. Predator-proof the enclosure so predators cannot enter and attack the livestock inside. Now, the herder is happy and far more willing to coexist peacefully with snow leopards or other predators. And the overall risk of retributive killing is greatly reduced, even stopped. Making this conservation action is clearly a win-win for both the cat and local people. In Ladakh, the village women operate traditional homestays, a form of bed and breakfast for tourists, which generates much needed cash for their families. Feeling less threatened, snow leopards now show themselves more to the delight of photographers like this group. In fact, Hemis National Park is known as the snow leopard capital of the world. Such activities provide economic incentives that best ensure Local people come to value snow leopards alive rather than dead. The cat now can concentrate on being a snow leopard and enjoy a meal of blue sheep, its natural prey, and only chase away those pesky magpies who want some of the offerings. Snow leopards are recognized as sacred totem animals by indigenous communities across Central Asia. 
Here, a Kyrgyz sacred site guardian interprets the meaning of an ancient petroglyph with images of snow leopards and ibex. He says the ibex live in the underworld, the snow leopards in the upper world. A human connects both worlds and balances them. Without this harmony, the earth will suffer. Every year, across the 12 snow leopard range countries, International Snow Leopard Day is celebrated on October the 23rd. Please protect this cat, its environment, and all nature for your children and grandchildren to enjoy. Conservationists are committed to give snow leopards, like this female and her three cubs, a brighter future. To learn more about the iconic ghost of the Himalaya, visit our website or that of other dedicated conservation organizations. Thank you for your attention and support, and stay safe. Up next, we have Dr. C. Johora, Program Director at the WWF India and co-founder of the Jabarkeet Nature Reserve in Missouri. Hi everyone, welcome to Jabarkeet Nature Reserve and I'm so delighted to be part of the Missouri Mountain Festival 2020 and thrilled that despite all the challenges outside, uh, the festival is back stronger than ever before. The story of Jabarkeet began about seven years ago and at that time we really didn't have you know, a, a clear plan of what this is going to turn out to be. We just had a vision. And the vision was that we wanted to protect, rewild and restore this 100 acre patch of forest and mountainside near Missouri. We started this journey uh, with, you know, with a lot of passion, uh, but not, not a lot of money and not a lot of resources. However, over the last five years since we've opened, we've had a remarkable recovery of both wildlife, of nature, and of the forest. And this is all due to the passion and the excitement of the people who have been part of it. Uh, I have been supported in this journey by many, many people, but mostly the local community with whom we have created this vision and this, this, um, this piece of, of nature that we've restored. Uh, our, our vision was really to just uh, create local livelihoods and create a, a, a sort of value for conservation so that people living in the area actually saw this not just as a hill to be exploited or a forest to be exploited, but something to be conserved. And I believe that we have been successful in that journey. Uh, we have created local jobs, we have created local livelihoods. Our model is very simple and very basic. We've trained local youth to become nature guides and they take visitors on walks through the forest. Surprisingly enough, even to our own surprise, uh, this has actually been a model that works and uh, we even broke even last year. However, um, you know, as you all know, over the last few months, uh, COVID has thrown a spanner in the works of many small uh, initiatives like ours. Uh, we had no visitors for six months. Uh, we did actually have, unfortunately, the kinds of visitors we did not want, which is poachers and, and wood collectors and fire, cut, fire uh, wood collectors. Uh, and uh, we're very happy now that uh, after six months of the shutdown from COVID, we started getting visitors again, and we look forward to reviving uh, the Jabarkhet model. Uh, my team and I welcome you to come and visit Jabarkhet to experience what a rewilded forest feels like and also to become supporter members and help us in the conservation of this little piece of wilderness in the Himalayas. Thank you. As darkness falls on Jabberkait Nature Reserve, many nocturnal animals begin to move about. Though human beings are not present, camera traps have been positioned to record images of wildlife in the secret shadows of the night. Triggered by motion sensors, the cameras capture photographs and videos the animals have taken of themselves. More than 20 different species of mammals are found in the reserve. And as a new day breaks, 
nature's perpetual cycle of life carries on. Located near Missouri, Jabberkate Nature Reserve occupies 100 acres of private land surrounded by government forests. The goal is to protect and restore the forest and its wildlife while also creating local livelihoods and promoting conservation awareness. Since 2015, when the reserve was opened, much of the forest cover has increased while many species of birds and animals have returned and multiplied. Three water holes in the reserve attract wildlife and the recovering habitat nurtures many species. Predators are active mostly at night, but also sometimes during the day, though they are wary of human beings and keep out of sight. More than 150 bird species can be seen in the reserve, both year-round residents and seasonal migrants. Visitors are welcome and trained naturalists from neighboring communities serve as guides to explain and interpret the many life stories that this forest sustains. Up next, we have Vivek Sarkar from the Wildlife Institute of India, who will speak on his research on cicadas. Hi, I'm Vivek. I work here at Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. I'm also pursuing my PhD from Northwest University, and I'm working on cicadas. As a kid, I wasn't a big fan of milk. But one morning, my mom saw me watching butterflies with rapt attention, lost to the outside world. And she devised a plan to give me milk while showing me butterflies. And that worked, and that worked for the longest time. And by the end of it, I not only started liking milk, but also me and my mom both became amateur butterfly watcher. It awakened the naturalist within me. Not only butterflies, I started observing everything everywhere. Starting from the ants and lizards in our storeroom to the dragonflies, damselflies, and the birds in our garden. At every possible opportunity, I would go to the grasslands and the forest near my house at Kujbihar. Which time, I also started recognizing different sounds and songs in nature. However, there is a constant comb scraping sound that I associated with my summer vacation. And also there is a sound of a constant ringing that I associate with my puja vacation that baffled me for the longest. See, there are basically four groups of animals that make sound in nature. The first are the birds, the second one are the frogs and toads, the third one are the cricket and grasshoppers, 
and the fourth one are the cicadas. The crickets and grasshoppers make their song by the help of their wings or by beating of their legs. Unlike them, cicadas have a particular organ at the base of their abdomen called timbal which helps them to produce sound. Only the male cicada produce sound. In India, we have the highest generic diversity of cicadas. However, very less is known about them and they are very highly understudied. So what are cicadas? Cicadas are basically bugs that can make lot of sound and only the male cicada makes sound where the female stay hidden and they just listen to the males and often they also respond to the male call by flicking their wings. They don't have the sound making organ. Cicadas are basically insects that you can hear but you can hardly see. They are literally like ninjas, ninjas hidden in the leaves. However, they, unlike ninjas, they are not active during the night, they are active mostly during the day. And unlike ninjas, they are also in a group and they also produce lot of sound. In India, we have more than 200 species of cicadas. However, we don't know the call for most of them. In recent time, I have been studying the cicadas in Garo, Khasi and Jaintia hills of Meghalaya, which was also the first effort to document their calls. I have been studying the cicadas in that region, not only there, but also in the other parts of Northeast region till last year. And now I have documented more than 50% of Indian cicadas. But after that, when I came here last year, I also got very fascinated with the cicadas that Dehradun Valley and Masuri had to offer. There are more than 40 species of cicada in these hills which has already been described from here. But till now we did not know much about their natural history or any other information. This year however, despite the lockdown, I get to study them a bit from my home here at Dehradun. And we have documented more than 20 species of cicadas from here in Dhun Valley and in Masuri Hills. Many of them have been recorded for the first time. Here are some of the calls. Many of the cicadas that you saw have a very unique story of rediscovery. For an example, this is Leptosaltria samia, a cicada described from Masuri and Dehradun. But for more than 100 years, nobody knew how to find them, where to get them, or how do they look like alive. In the month of July, while returning from Masuri, we have heard this amazing sound. It was as if a mechanized man-made sound, but coming from a forest. So we waited. We stopped and we tracked the sound. Turn out, it was a very interesting cicada. Later, when we recorded the sound and got to see the cicada up close and personal, we got to know it was a cicada that was described more than 100 years back. Similarly, we have got other cicadas which are very fascinating, very colourful and at the top, lousy. There is also a very interesting fact about them. For an example, different cicada emerges at different time of the year. Not only that, after emerging, the male also call in a certain time of the year. Few cicadas call throughout the day. Some of them call at a very particular and unique time. For an example, the cicada that you just saw, it calls right after the bird activity and right before the bat activity starts. As you know, birds and bats, they are known to be insectivore and they do feed on cicadas because they are the easy prey. For an example, they are there, they are good food and at the same time, they also announce their presence. So it's a very easy pick for the insectivores. But as you can see, this is a cicada that is much smaller and very trivial call. There are other cicadas which are quite loud, so loud that you can't even stay three feet away from it. For an example, this is Platylomia brevis. Although they look green and black like an army costume, but however, they can make really loud noise.
these are just few of the cicadas that you get to hear here and see. However, along this Himalayan range, there are many cicadas that has evolved independently and every area of Himalayas have their own cicada. For an example, you get to see this big cicadas here, but in Northeast India, the cicada diversity is again entirely different from what you see here in Masuri. I have worked only in a very small part of India, that is this part of Western Himalayas, the Eastern Himalayas and the state of Meghalaya. And in this short time, I have covered more than 50% of known cicada diversity from India. Now I know that constant ringing of bell in the forest is a cicada called the bell of the forest. It is also called Dunduvia Hastata. And the cone scraping sound that I used to hear in the summer happens to be a cicada which is first time reported from India. When it comes to Indian cicadas, there are many more forests to be explored, there are many more mysteries to be revealed, and there are many more cicadas to be discovered. <laughs> Chore <laughs> 